So that is now recording. So where's the camera, please? Okay. So welcome back to Potentialization. And today we've got a really interesting conversation with Heather, who's a business development manager at Vertical Souls. Uh, let's just say hello to Heather. And then what I want to do is I'm going to give you a little bit of introduction to potentialization with respect to the development side, etc., and why we're talking to Vertical Souls as our partners. So yeah. welcome, so, Heather. John, yeah, John, it's going to be a very interesting, inf informative uh, podcast. Uh, we'll be listening about uh, potentialization. So I think it's a very, very big platform, potentialization. We would be love to hear about that. Please start with uh, potentialization. So potentialization, what I want to do is give us a very brief history, almost my life, but in very, very quick terms. So I've been a software engineer. If you count being fascinated by electronics and various things right back to school at about 10 years old, started playing with programmable calculators and all sorts of things. So software has been part of my life all of that time. So what's really interesting, though, is many people who are programmers and do those kind of things like computers. They like the details. I like what we can achieve with software. If it gets too detailed for the sake of it, I start to get tired. What I really want to be looking at is the architecture, how we produce systems, how they fit together, and how we solve problems. So that involves talking to people. It took me quite a lot of years of, of being in a software company to start to understand that you don't build what the customer asks for to start with. What you need to do is say, why do you want to do that? Because far too many people come and say, I want to build a system. And what they're doing is just saying, how they want you to build their interpretation of what they need, but they haven't actually told you why or what it's for. If you can get underneath what they're saying to why they're doing it, as a software architect, you start to understand how this will all fit together really well. So that's my background technically, but the other side of my life was always about what is life? Uh, right through to philosophy, what, 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 what are we? What is consciousness? And I went on a long journey of exploring uh, all sorts of different things. But one of the things I found was something called spiral dynamics, maybe 20 years ago, which was about stage development uh, model of psychology and how people, and in fact, actually cultures, go through stages of complexity. And if anybody's heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that's... Uh, a really simple view of how we go through stages of basic physical survival, emotional needs, uh, build, breaking out of perhaps a, a family or tribal setting to a bigger culture needs the individual ego of understanding of yourself separate from parents, from mum, etc. Then you to build a, a civilized structure uh, or nations and things, you need a much higher level of complexity. But of course, we've also seen in more recent decades that people have broken out and started to look at much more scientific uh, exploration of the world, building a lot more technology, all sorts of things. That in turn then leads to people starting to say, hang on a minute, all this technology, we're using all of the world's resources up. We're going to run out of planet if we're not careful. What about the rights of individuals that are perhaps at the bottom of that structure that are not doing so well, that special needs of various sorts that might need support of society, having a purely economic model or can sometimes be unfair on some of the people. So we need a bigger picture there. But one of the key things that's been happening is that those worldviews as they develop in people and cultures tend to compete because they think they've got the latest and greatest and best view of how the world should work. Potentialization is actually about recognizing that all of the models have arisen because they're useful. And actually, it's a synergy of bringing them together that's really needed. So that was really profound for me. And that was like, ah, I can potentially do something in the world that would help. And for quite a few years, I was thinking, how can I use my software skills an architecture vision of how software should be built together with how we might help individuals and society and culture understand it itself 
and themselves better to try and make a way. Now, of course, in recent years, we've seen an explosion of artificial intelligence. We're seeing an explosion in various technologies of robots, self-driving cars, uh, voice recognition, large language. The world is at the beginning of huge changes. And the complexity that we will need as people to cope and evolve and grow with that, rather than fold our arms at the back and say, I don't want anything to do with that. It's coming. We can't stop it. So we actually even greater need for people to be more understanding, more agile, because the skills that our parents learned, however many years yeah. ago, are going to be different to what, what we need in the future. So that, that was the vision of what can I do? How can I help individuals understand themselves better? So it's a really big vision. And when I start looking at what it could be, if, if the system understands an individual and where they're going, it could have huge potential for not just understanding yourself, but what's your relationship with other people, which could get into recruitment or dating or networking or team building. Also yeah, your VN, your VN seems like it's going to hit millions of people. Is that correct? Well, that's the hope. Uh, yeah. As a software architect, I'm not a marketer. So we, we don't just need to, to build it. We need to have resonance at least with at least some partners and affiliates. Because to reach millions of people directly would be hard work. We're not going to put TV adverts out. That would cost you. So we're going to have to build it up from the ground up and hopefully work really well with organizations, coaches, uh, charities perhaps, and companies over time and build that up and, and hopefully make a difference in the world. Uh, so that that's the overall vision. Now, without much money, I, I, I didn't initially want to say, how do I sell this vision and raise lots of money because that venture capital, all that kind of stuff is challenging. So, so I started off looking for, well, how can I get some development resources at the price that I can use my little bit of money that I've got to start with without getting tied into venture capitals and it being into businesses that might drive you for profit, potentially at the expense of the underlying view that potentialization is about helping individuals. It's okay, not so, about the profit. Okay. How is your experience with Vertical Souls in terms of working on our developers working on potentialization under your VN? What I've got to do is just go back a little step because I actually found a company in Vietnam to start with. They were really good technically, but it was a really good experience because once we built up to a certain stage, it became more challenging because the communication was harder. We did really well uh, talking about the specifications and me send them a, a document saying, I want a screen to look like this and I want the, it to do. But once we got to the details and we had to actually talk, and that was... Uh, I think during COVID time, and we were trying to have conversations. Their English wasn't clear. And the conversations got more and more difficult uh, trying to resolve some of the technical issues and, and understanding. That takes me, we had a pause after that. And then how do I get started again? I was looking for a new partner, some somebody to help. And very, very luckily, came across Vertical Souls on one of the online systems where you can find people uh, to do work. And that was very different from the start. What I've found is, I understand in Pakistan, English is actually a formal language. It's not just something that people, some people learn uh, as an ex. So you actually use English all the time and that's incredibly vital. So what I've got is the best of both worlds that we've got uh, an, a really exciting team of people with lots of different skills in Vertical Souls, but also, I can communicate so we get an extremely good value and we're making much more progress in all of the details and the subtleties of this little issue is not working all those kind of things so really really excited when we first found vertical souls a uh, couple of different things we're doing with you so we've got two or three different developers and we're having excellent conversations with everybody uh, which is really exciting so what i what i'd say is it, it's really useful to go and find uh, development. Uh, if, if I went to the UK, I would be looking at much more money. 
if we go to the US, developers cost double again. So yeah. incredibly good value for money, but an excellent team with all the relevant skills and the communication. So it's extremely challenging to get all of those together. So I, I feel really fortunate to have found them. Okay, John, uh, now can I uh, tell you about uh, the, vertical, the services that Vertical Souls are offering in the vast fields of artificial intelligence? Yes. I mean, do, do you know the background? Because you're a business development manager. I don't know if you've been there from the start. Do, yeah, do you know I've the been... history and how it came about? Yeah. About what? Do you know how the company was first created and the vision behind it? Or uh, did you join a little later? No, no. Uh, so Vertical Souls was created one year back and I was the first member. Uh, after his one, uh, he, uh, we both collaborated and created this team of developers marketers and now it's a team of 40 to 50 uh, developers and overall people and we are working in artificial intelligence uh, web website development web applications and uh, we have a very big team of mobile application in which we are handling uh, flutter react native uh, even native mobile apps for android and ios and uh, we have successfully completed more than 50 projects in mobile apps on mobile already so that, that's because yeah. because one year is quick to get from two people yeah. to uh, 50 yeah. in one year is, is amazing yeah it's amazing and uh, the progress in our mobile application development team is also very you know amazing because we have created so many successful projects and mm -hmm. our users our clients are very happy uh, they're very satisfied with our work and we are expanding our team uh, we have a vision that uh, we are going to build a team of 1,000 uh, only developers for web and mobile application uh, in over coming three years. Wow, 1,000 in three years. That's really exciting. Now, of course, from my point of view, uh, from potentialization point of view, I want to have millions of users because the more users we've got, the more people we can help. But I had to start somewhere. So what I've started with, which was the closest to, I talked about spiral dynamic stage development models, was to work with our partners to put the initial system to use with uh, psychological instruments that measure uh, vertical development, stage development models. But what I didn't want to do was build something specifically just for that. What I wanted to do was build a data engine with a survey collection system and an engine to, to calculate the results of that and produce reports. So what we've built is a survey engine that could be used for psychological instruments, but actually it could be used for HR surveys. Uh, you could use it about your interests and skills to try and build up a map of the whole individual. So we've got a really powerful engine and we're just on the verge of deploying that with the first customers in the next few weeks. So that has been built, we decided at the time when we first started, maybe three years ago. So it's been done slowly and organically as opposed to big investment. But we decided at the time React was probably the best bet for a web development. And it's built in Node at the back end. And I know you cover quite a lot of different development platforms, which is really useful. But what I will do as we move forward and start to collect data, it's really going to be really important for me to plug the AI in to start looking at the relationship between those different psychological instruments so we can start to understand the whole person. So I'm really, really excited to hear more about what you're looking at with AI. Uh, yeah, we'll we'll obviously that, uh, be client as well on, on a mobile for people to fill surveys in. We're just web-based at the moment. But the AI in particular is going to be a really key feature of what we do in the future. Yeah, about that, uh, the research center in Vertical Souls is also very progressive. And uh, right now uh, we're working... Uh, on uh, our AI driven chatbots are becoming more sophisticated with improved natural language processing and understanding. Uh, they, are, they can handle more complex queries now. Uh, they can provide personalized responses and interact more naturally with users. Uh, this is now enhancing our customer service. It's reducing operational costs to the companies. And also it's gonna be 24 by seven support for any, any kind of business. Mm -hmm. And other than chatbots, uh, Vertical Souls, the search center of Vertical Souls is working on voice cloning, uh, in vo AI voice cloning technology, uh, which is becoming increasingly realistic and indistinguishable from human speech. And uh, right now, our uh, chatbot and even uh, a voice cloning 
product is launched on our website verticalsouls.com and okay. uh, anybody can try chatbots uh, over there uh, it's totally ai based and uh, uh, totally our product and uh, what, what sorry one of the things i'm really interested in which yeah. i think will potentially make potentialization more powerful is that as we build a map of the individual what, what, what one of the traditionally very popular if you get into the formal psychology of people is something called big five uh, people talk about ocean openness uh, conscientiousness etc introvert extrovert levels is yeah. that as our system builds a map of the individual one of the things which will be really fascinating is to plug a chatbot in and I've seen a lot of people start talking about wanting to create a coaching system that plugs the large language model chat stuff in. But imagine if we've got a map so that when we start talking to the large language model in our chat system, it will be saying, I'm a really strong introvert. What do you think might be a good job for me if I ask that question or what do you think what, can, can you tell me about this or or if it knows my level of education and all of that is automatically in the system so all the queries into the system are going to have much better context for me personally yeah uh, that's uh, that's true um, ai models like uh, chat gpt4 and beyond are pushing boundaries of creativity by generating text images and music and even content uh, video content so this can revolutionize content creation and marketing and entertainment, enabling rapid production of high quality materials. Yes. Yeah, you can absolutely. also support industries like education and training by generating uh, tailored learning materials and simulations. And, and this is why it's, I'm really exciting to be working, excited to be working with you because you've got all those technical skills. What, one of the key things for potentialization is that we see sometimes hallucination in the large language models what's happening is they're just a statistical model that says what's the most likely next word they introduce randomness so you don't get the same answer every time you ask the same question uh, to make it, it, it more realistic but if there isn't much information out on the internet about a particular subject that you've asked maybe those things haven't reached the internet they're private or there's just not much research or whatever it is it will literally still say what's the most likely next word, but it could have picked it up from anywhere random that happened to be even close to the subject. And one of the other key things for me is that if we've trained our large language model on all of the internet, remember I talked about those stage models and world views and, and my belief that all of the world views are interesting we need to look after people in a structured society. We need entrepreneurial input. Uh, we need profit driven to drive capital allocation effectively. But we also need social responsibility to make sure everybody's being looked after and we're not abusing some people or various things around the world. But when the large language model is being trained, how do we know which worldview the different bits of information are coming from? If it's purely factual and scientifically checked and researched, probably okay but the more we start training on people's opinions and other documents whereas if we start to build a model of the individual we can start to map human values into the world that the large language models are training on so that's something i'm really fascinated for the longer distance future how can we anchor the artificial intelligence and the large language responses to human values more effectively to make sure we're aligned and we're not just because one of the very big dangers is that some of the biggest companies in the world are building some of the, the, the large language models, but they're perhaps, shall we say, more profit driven than society driven at times. So to have more mapping between what matters to humans and human society, as well as the profit side will be really useful. Yeah, John, uh, I think uh, large language mod models can revolutionize customer service by providing intelligent chatbots that understand and respond to customer inquiries with a high degree of accuracy and empathy. This can enhance, I think, uh, customer satisfaction and loyalty with reducing need for human intervention, right? Absolutely. 
Yes. And what, what I'm hoping is that our project, if we do get tens of millions of people, will add value to that process to make it even more effective. Because uh, there's a danger if we're only using anonymous data, shall we say, that, that, that it might not necessarily capture some, some of the nuance of what's happening. Absolutely. It's incredible. I think the thing we should say is we have no idea how good this is going to be good, going to get in the next few years. It's moving so quickly. So given that you've got all those skills, what about some of the more of the more human bits about your company in terms of how you build a team? How do you make sure you get the right people? All, all those kind of things. OK, so we built this team by experiments. Our CTO, Rizwan Iqbal, gave us complete uh, independence in doing any kind of experiments. So uh, we built some products. We build, uh, we basically, would, most of our work is service-based. We deal with companies and provide them services. So the best thing about that is uh, the professionalism in our work. Yeah. We follow the international standards uh, of the programming communities. And uh, this is the main thing which uh, other companies might not follow and that's why they fail. Uh, so in our all our projects, we follow uh, Scrum and Agile method methodologies in order to make them successful. Cool. So, I mean, I, I've just literally be a few minutes before we were talking, uh, I, I've done something in the past, which I built quickly uh, because it was just a favor to help somebody out just in the past. And, and we got an error and I'd accidentally deleted some lines of code by mistake. Well, because I'd just done it very quickly as, as so, but of course, automated testing, all those kind of things can actually find them because you, if you build your tests up as you go, you've got all the regression testing. There's so many things. And I think I've got a, a book called Sooner, Safer, Happier, which I've got, and it looks really exciting, but I've not actually read it. But it's all about uh, DevOps yeah. and how we're moving towards a world where what one of the big issues now in big systems is that you might look after the software extremely well and carefully, but the environment that you install it with changes as the operating system gets upgraded and all sorts of things. So people start to talk now about uh, environment, not saying the right word, but an environment as software. So you literally install it or you put it in Docker or something like that to make sure you've got a tight control of the complete environment. So the software world has moved incredibly. So following the standards is just so important compared to how I used to do it 40 years ago. A lot happening. So what, what, what challenges are you facing as a business at the moment? Um, in terms of... Uh challenges that we are facing is uh, our, uh, you know, sometimes we face talent shortage over here, uh, a lack of unprofessional behavior from some uh, our employees and some kind, uh, sometime we get problem in getting proper leads uh, as a business developer, I will say, uh, where we, uh, we get problem in terms of getting business. Mm -hmm. Uh, for that, uh, we have to build a very good trust factor with clients over US and UK, or uh, most of the client bases from there. So uh, we have to deal with uh, deal it with every day, but we are doing it. Now, being a little bit selfish. Yeah, uh, I think it, once they start uh, working with us, once they start working with us, they get completely. They became our fan. Our they were, they become yes. Of our work. Yeah, what, what I was going to say is, is if I'm thinking a little bit selfishly, as we've got our platform set up, uh, it will be really nice to be able to pinch a little bit of time from all of your employees to do a few of our surveys, uh, to, to just experiment, uh, to see, see how valuable it is, to try and help, because it might help you in your recruitment and finding which values work best, which people are good for which roles, all those kind of things. As yeah. an experiment, I'm not saying it will necessarily. Yeah, uh, all employees of Vertical Souls are open to provide any assistance for potentialization. Yep. There's no issue with that. Yes, and, and that's really why I'm very excited because the team has really been positive about what we're trying to do, uh, which I didn't have with the previous development. They got on with it quite mechanically. So they literally did what I said, I wrote a list, one, two, three, and they would do one, two, three. 
but I would ask a question about it, but they wouldn't understand the question because I was talking about a, a bigger picture that they hadn't yeah. understood the why and what it was about. And that's what I've seen is very different with your team, that they're really getting involved in what the projects are about and not just producing code. Because if you just produce the code and the subtle thing's not right, they won't spot them if you don't know what it's for. You need to know why you're doing it. Then you can see, ah, that shouldn't produce that result because uh, that doesn't make sense that it's done that from the wrong place. But if they're only looking at code, they're not going to know the difference. So, 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 did you have ways of saying is a project successful from your point of view? The code is it going well? How do you measure? Say you've got a web development project. Okay, so we have uh, just say we got a web development project. Uh, we put that project into smaller milestones. Yeah. Uh, divide each task to our developer. And then uh, they perform every task on even before that given deadline. Uh, the thing is, our, our program, team of our programmers are very hardworking, mm -hmm. so they work on it. And uh, after it is tested out by the team of SK, and then it's delivered to the client. Cool. Well, one of the things I should say is uh, when I was talking to Vietnam. They were from the UK, I forget how many hours, maybe seven. So, and they would work normal business hours a lot of the time. So often there was that time delay. For myself to you guys, Vertical Souls in Pakistan, I think it's four or five. But I honestly don't even notice because your guys often yeah. work late into That's the night. Because the communication is good. That's because the communication is very good and very effective with you. Yes. Yes. But I mean, your guys are available. They often work till 10, 11 at night uh, and and start maybe a little bit later. Sometimes they start early and finish late. I know they do. They probably work too hard. Uh, from a psychological point of view, I would say be careful. As they get a bit older, uh, it, it, that gets hard work. But it, but it's good to see that dedication as they're young. Uh, and actually, the, the fact that you're willing to shift the day to match our UK times. Uh, which is really useful. So they, there is practically no communication delay at all at any time because uh, because the guys are so flexible. Yes. I'm just wondering what else I wanted to ask you. Have you, you cover a lot of technology now, don't you? You, you said Flutter and different things. Yeah. Uh, we are in, we are both in web and mobile application development. So I said that uh, previously I said about uh, Flutter and React Native and uh, Swift and Kotlin. So we are building cross-platform plus native applications. So you'll use Swift for iOS specific, specific Apple things? Yeah. And then React Native if it's? It's cross-platform for iOS and Android both. With a okay. single code base, uh, we can give you a application for web, even web and uh, mobile and mm. both iOS and Android. Uh, is, I don't know all the details. Is Flutter totally cross-platform if you use Flutter? Yeah, it's totally cross-platform. We can create web, mobile, both with, with single code base. Wow. So can you actually mix it, though? Because what you don't want on your PC when you open a big web browser is a little yeah. screen that's dedicated for a, a mobile device. So it could be totally, uh, what do they call it, reactive in terms of the screen. Yeah, it's totally responsive. Uh, responsive, that's the word, yes. Yeah, responsive. And uh, we also offer uh, use, uh, UI and UX services. And uh, the best thing about our successful projects of mobile applications is that we provide, we do a user research. Uh, we get the user journey, and then we start the user in, uh, making the user interface of that application. And once that approved from the client, uh, we start the actual uh, development of the mobile applications. So if a big company came to you and said, we've got, I mean, I'm different because I'm a software engineer and I've spent lots of years thinking about what this would be. But if you've got a big company come to you that's in the UK or US and they're looking at a project, but they're a little bit vague because they're not software people, you can actually talk to their employees that will use the system, find out what they want to do and actually engage with it, not yeah. just take a, a finished specification. 
Yeah, the first thing we will do is we, we will do a system analysis of their whole business, what kind of yeah. product they are going to build, and then uh, we uh, we get the user journey from their side. And uh, uh, the intellectuals in our BD team, uh, business development team, provide suggestions that what should be done in a better way to improve their idea of their application. And after that, we can we make uh, after the user research is done, we make the user interface of that application in Figma. Okay, so you mock the screens up, what they're going to look like. Yeah, we make a complete prototype of how the actual application will work. Yeah. So when the client is satisfied from that mockup, from that prototype, we do the actual code and build the whole application. Now for people, I, I'm a little bit technical. Well, I'm a lot technical, but not necessarily yeah. up with the latest stuff. So when we say a mockup, Figma can actually, you can actually have a button and click on it and go to the second yeah. screen. So it's like a mini working version of the system. It's not just pictures. Yes, it's a mini version. It's an actual version of that whole application. Uh, yeah. The difference is uh, from the actual application and Figma prototype is that you can't deploy the Figma or it's not uh, yeah. you know functional, but it can show all the it it's just it's just a representation of how the actual application will work. So it won't have a database behind it. It's not going to have any actual customer data in it, but you can navigate your way around the system to get a feel for how it all fits together. Uh, the uh, prototype doesn't have any database or other than uh, yeah that's what i say no database but you can look at all the different screens and see the connections so you would go from screen one to screen two if you press that yeah. button so yes, you get a, an overview of the whole thing works. even the small yeah. animations and small interactivity responsiveness everything works yeah. perfectly in figma wow i didn't realize it was quite so powerful uh, because okay. it's useful because uh, if uh, we work, we make an application without Figma, then, you know, the clients get a, a lot of revisions in the design, yes. in the functionality, in the features. But once the Figma is locked and yeah. it's approved by the client, there's no, there's nothing that can be changed after that. Yes, because I've learned that some of the theory of software development, and of course, if you get the design of it wrong and go ahead and implement it and it goes out to a thousand customers, that's a lot of trouble. Yeah. If you can get the issues sorted out at a very early stage in the system, it's going to be much more effective. So I'm curious then, if, if you've got a system that's going to take a year to build one person, I mean, I'm just wondering, if you do a Figma first, how long does Figma take to put together relative to doing the actual system? It's obviously going to be much faster, but... Well, that depends on uh, how much the front end of that application uh, will, the time estimation will be of that project. Yeah. If, it, if you say it's a one year project, then I think uh, two months, uh, two to three months will be required to make the whole figma of that application. Now, one of the things I'd say to some users at this point is they might say, you mean we can't have a we can't even start to see the real system for three months why are we wasting time but what i'd say is that as we said before if you get the design right yes that will then flow much more effectively when you start to build the system because there's far less mistakes yes uh, uh, actually development work should be after the completion of figma it helps in making the project successful so does that mean then that if you've got a customer that's not sure about a system, they're not ready to commit and say, let's say that we're doing that one year project. They're not ready to commit and say, I want to do a full year's project. I've got everything in place. I'm... Could they come to you and say, look, I've got an idea and you could do the Figma stage. And then they might have a lot more confidence to say, yeah, we really like it. Now we're more confident to, to do the rest. Yeah, that also depends on the client's uh, needs. Uh, there are some clients that don't even need a very modern and minimalistic type of uh, user interface. So yeah. for those type of clients, uh, those type of projects, we uh, we just make a simple layout, uh, even on page and paper. Yeah. And we uh, start the actual development work without even the Figma. Yeah, because I mean, if you've got a bank, and all it's got to do is take the transactions of the day and add them to the account. There is no interface. It, it varies on the project, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, so that's fascinating. Yeah. 
I'm, I'm looking on the AI side. I'm really excited for the future. What, what, what do you think about AI in general and how fast it's changing? That's got to be a challenge, doesn't it? Because there's new technology coming literally every day, every week. Yeah, AI is transforming the way we live and work, and it's offering tremendous potential for innovation and efficiency across various fields. Uh, you know, uh, it's already revolutionized uh, industries like healthcare, uh, finance, and transportation with its uh, ability, with its ability to analyze vast amount of data and make uh, predictions or decisions that improve outcomes and streamline processes. Uh, I think AI is uh, poised to become even more integrated into our daily lives with mm. advancements. We do every kind of work. We start with chat GPT. We get suggestions from there. You know, the key, the key will yeah. be balancing this progress with ethical considerations, I think, and uh, ensuring AI is developed and uh, uh, deployed in ways that are fair, transparent and beneficial to society. And I think yeah. the... Uh, the future of AI holds exciting possibilities from solving complex global challenges uh, to enhancing individual experiences and productivity. Yes. I, 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 and I obviously want to build a system that's about people, but a lot of my background is technical and I follow quite closely some of the developments of self-driving cars and the huge thing that is about to happen it's beginning to happen in Amazon, where they've got the first human humanoid, human shape form robots. They're a little bit simple, those first ones, and they don't look totally very human yet, but they're already moving boxes around the Amazon factories and trialing it, and they've got a lot of robots. But there's a huge amount of investment by a lot of companies to build robots that obviously have got AI inside them. You'll be able to literally have a conversation with a humanoid robot but it will also be able to do incredible tasks like people. So we're going to see a massive shift. I'm going to say shift because some jobs, if you if you drive a truck for all of your life, in five years, you might be replaced by the truck that drives itself. It's going to take a little while because they have to build new trucks. All the electric trucks work, will work much better and the challenges with batteries at the moment, all sorts of things. So it's going to take a few years, but it's happening more and more. So there'll be a lot of jobs that just disappear. But... People are always ingenious. They always find new things to do. And yeah. human... Developers. Sorry? Uh, developers. Yeah. yeah. Yes, developing will certainly be one of the things we do. But the other, the other, another huge aspect is, well, it's anything that's creative that might need our consciousness as people to say, I've got empathy. Because no matter how good the artificial intelligence looks and sounds like a person, it's not actually a person. So, yeah. I mean, if you go for coffee now, and you go to the coffee shop in town, 50 years ago, they would have said you were crazy to spend all that much money. But you're not just going for coffee, you're going for the whole experience. So I think we're going to see a shift to a lot, a lot more jobs. We'll get different aspects, obviously, the development, the technology side, but also the human side. Just come and be with people, experience things. Shopping might be more interactive with both the robots and somebody there to talk to about all the different things. So the world potentially could look incredibly different. So that's one of the things potentialization is about. How do individuals find our creativity, uh, adjust to the world, all those kinds of things. So. Uh, so, so I'm really excited with the partnership because what we've got with you guys is you understand what I'm trying to do, and you're good at the technology. So, yeah, exciting. Yeah, that's pretty exciting. Uh, so I think uh, let's conclude the meeting. Uh, yeah, I think we did quite well. Hopefully I didn't talk too much. Uh, it, it was perfect. You were perfect in everything. You are far more better than me. <laughs> no, no. I'm, I, if, if you asked me about an interview about random things, I am terrible. But when I get talking about this, I get excited. Yeah, I, so. I see your passion about potentialization. And I'm impressed yes. from it. Yes. Now, but, but the thing is, as I say, I'm not good at the details. I can do them. But when I spend every day doing details all the time, I get really 
frustrated because I want to get on and build it. And hopefully together we, we can do something really exciting. Okay, yeah, we can definitely do another uh, podcast uh, that will be into the details of potentialization. Uh, is that all yeah, right? Yeah, uh, that, uh, that would that be interesting as well. Uh, well. I might not be quite as excited because I might get a bit a headache when we start talking about React and things. Uh, I'm trying to learn bits of it. What, what I've been better on is SvelteKit uh, on our other system uh, because I really like SvelteKit because it's just much more human and much more... You only have to think about one file at a time when you're programming, whereas React, you need, you've got, I tried to learn some Angular and it was horrible with a whole, you'd need six text files to produce one web page. And it's like, that hurts. I want to concentrate on what I'm trying to do, not all these different files that process the input, process the output, do the transformation, all sorts of things. And I, I understand React maybe in the middle of those two, but SvelteKit, so easy. But of course, SvelteKit is newer. It hasn't got the same libraries and all the other things that React's got. So there would be challenges in other things using SvelteKit. But I, I really like SvelteKit is because it's much more human to work with. For, for example, I, I, I could recommend to somebody that's got very few development resources themselves, get somebody to build you something in SvelteKit. But then you, if you've got access and you're reasonably technical, could change the owner of the business, could change the HTML in the pages and make minor changes themselves it's much more accessible to normal people uh, whereas angular i think you've got to be a really technical nerdy geek kind of deep level programmer to get some of those things yeah, but of course I the ai is going to do the programming soon as well so yeah interesting i think that Shahid Shahid is doing a very good job with you absolutely really really good yes a summer really good job as well uh, and kasim is helping him out now uh, Shahir is using this felt kit, which I can help with. That makes it much easier for me. And I only, I've only i done tiny bits of the React. If I change little bits of code, I can change the name of a button, things like that. Uh, but it's harder for me to get into the code on the React side. But cool. Okay. Shall I press end recording? Uh, yeah, you can. Thank you. Thank you, John.